Ah, hello. This is Tom from anti-proton.com. Before I tell you about today's topic, uh, let me explain. The reason I'm wearing the rubber glove is not really for the depression glass, as you can see I'll hold it with this hand too, or this piece. It's, uh, it's because of my uh, polonium piece, which I have right here, which obviously should be touched with rubber gloves. I think we can all agree on that. Um, I'm here, of course, with the Geiger counter, like usual. Let me cut the sound off. My goal today is to talk to you a little bit about rainwater, radioactive rainwater. I posted videos about this before. Um, let me start with this, because a lot of people on YouTube have a tendency to watch three seconds of a video and then form a complete conclusion about what the rest of the video is without actually, you know, watching it. So, for all of you who don't do that, thank you. For all of you who do, let me just explain quickly. I'm not attacking anybody's readings. Not attacking them. Not attacking anybody. For a couple of reasons. First off, it is possible to have incredibly high radioactive readings from rain, although incredibly unlikely. But my god, it, yeah. but, but it is technically possible. And B, what would happen if I said that they were all fake and wrong? And then I went out tomorrow and I found some super duper high readings. Of course, nobody would believe me then, or they would say, oh, you said they were wrong. Of course, then again, if I walked outside and found five, six thousand counts per minute coming from my rainwater, I would document the whole thing. And I would do so with my camera in such a way that you could see the rain falling from the sky to an area that I would test. And I would show you my paper towel that I would use beforehand. I would scan it carefully to show you my hands all in one video. I would wipe it on the ground and show you, you know, I would test everything. And of course I would make it incredibly open and, and uh, the video would be like an hour long, but as a result of it you would see every square inch of it and you would know that absolutely everything was realistic. Then I would take it, you'd watch me seal it up and send it away to a, a laboratory. I would get back my official results from the laboratory, post it on the, on the site, and I would post all the video before getting my lab results back. So that means I would post, that, that means if I didn't post lab results, then people might say, well, they must not have been favorable to what you thought. You see, that, prevent, and that prevents me from getting away with anything. In other words, I would be open and transparent. And I know all of you would too, right? Yeah. So, I'm not attacking anybody in particular, or anything in particular, but I would like to point out the incredible, incredible unlikeliness of finding anything over a few hundred counts per minute in your rainwater. First off, the two competing theories, discounting the insane ones, the two competing scientifically believable theories for rainwater contamination of radiation are radon daughters wash out and Fukushima. Fukushima is sort of obvious to everybody. That basically means radiation gets blown up in the atmosphere from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant melting down. It flies across the air to wherever you are, in my case the United States, and then it rains down upon me. I pick it up a Geiger counter. This type of radiation is likely to be very, very low in the number of becquerels, that's decays, per second. The reason is first off, as much radiation as, as there was that came out of Japan, it has to diffuse into a very large amount of area. And yes, I know the jet stream has little tunnels and funnels and tubes of air moving and so on, but the, regardless, regardless of that fact, if it's falling on me, then it is a reasonable assumption that it's fallen on others beforehand. Reasonable assumption. And as a result of that, the radiation has had to make it a long distance, steadily losing particles over time. And very little radiation has been found in large concentrations outside of Japan. A lot of people will state that radiation was found that was 500 times the legal limit of this, 200 times the legal limit of that, but these legal limits are usually very small. Japan, of course, is cranking their legal limits up so that things won't be illegal anymore, which is kind of terrible and bad. But normally, legal limits are pre set pretty low, a few hundred becquerels per liter, a couple hundred becquerels per, per kilogram, that sort of thing. So to be a couple hundred times those limits is still usually pretty small. Several hundred becquerels of an, uh, of an average substance that's radioactive is not going to make a Geiger counter tick very much. This uh, piece of uranium glass, for example, is probably, I don't know, maybe 
couple, maybe 100, 200 becquerels per gram, something like that. It's, it's a pretty decent amount. It's uranium. A very small amount of uranium in here, but there's enough to color it nice and green, isn't there? And I don't get very much from it. Part of that, of course, is this Geiger counter is not very sensitive. And that's true. My other Geiger counter gets a couple hundred counts off of this. But still, you need a surprising amount of uranium to get a couple hundred counts. The main reason for this, though, is the efficiency of Geiger counters. Geiger counters are not 100% efficient at detecting things. When a Geiger counter is exposed to a thousand pieces of radiation, if you like, per, sec uh, per minute, thousand of them, th instead of having a thousand counts per minute, it has maybe two or three hundred at the most. The reason is, of course, the efficiency, the distance from the object, because the same amount of radiation has to continuously fill an ever-expanding amount of area as you stand, as you step away from your source. And also the continuous slowdown of particles as a result of attenuation. To put that mouthful into a uh, more reasonable terms, alpha and beta radiation are both very electromagnetically, uh, well, active. Beta radiation, standard beta radiation, it's beta negative, has a electrical charge of negative one, so it's a minus if you like. And alpha radiation has, a, has an electrical charge of positive two. Both of these go shooting off every old direction. They don't just go in a straight line, and as a result they lose energy. Because remember, you lose energy when you change your momentum without adding anything to it. If you are moving a straight line and you, you curve, in order to curve you have to lose energy. Unless, of course, you have like rocket motors and you're gaining energy and stuff and whatever. That's a different issue, but you get the point. Ga uh, gamma's a little bit different. It can kind of shoot straight through and whatnot. But anyhow, um, this continuous slowdown is a, a cal calculatable pretty, pretty easily. Uh, if you look at my previous video uh, where I was telling you how to calculate the energy that comes out of polonium-210, for example, to calibrate your Geiger counter, that used the continuous slowdown effect. And you, I showed you how to do the math. It's actually pretty simple to do. Um, in fact, at the end of this video, I'll show you how to do it for radon-222 just for giggles. The result is that there's a lot less actual radiation that you can detect on a Geiger counter, like this guy, than you would if you could somehow capture all of the radiation. In fact, most of the time when a scientist wants to know the actual activity of something, they have to, well, derive it. If I had a, if this were an, a radioactive, well, it is a radioactive, radioactive object, but if, let's say this were all one type of material, that way I don't have to worry about the complexities of it, okay? and I knew my efficiency for it with a Geiger counter, I knew that I was 25% efficient, then if I calculate 100 counts per minute from this at contact, then I'm realistically uh, saying 400 counts per minute. Let's say my Geiger, counter, my Geiger counter was big enough to capture one half of this. Then we could multiply that by two because there's another half of it and half the radiation is going this way. Realistically, that's not accurate either because some of it's going up and down, but it's mostly accurate. So instead of 400, now I have 800 counts per minute. And, of course, there are other factors such as uh, uh, um, Geiger counter dead time and some other things that come into effect, meaning that this could be as much as a thousand counts per minute in, re in reality, even though I only detect a hundred counts per minute from it. That being the case, if you detect a thousand counts per minute from your rain, I want you to think about how much radiation that rainwater would actually have. Alpha particles only are able to go a couple centimeters usually. Example, radon-222, I did a calculation on it, which I can throw on the site if you want to see it, and I calculated that it had an average distance of a before full and complete attenuation of 4.302 centimeters. That means four, where's my trusty ruler right here? All right, one, two, three, four. You can't see very much, but that's four centimeters right there. That's four centimeters. Here's a AA battery. 4.03. This this battery is just a tiny, tiny, tiny touch longer than the distance alpha particles can go. So they attenuate pretty fast. So when you wipe a square meter with a cloth and then you hold it up and you're detecting 5, 10, 15,000, whatever counts per minute, 
think of how much radiation would actually have to be there. Radon daughters do not usually produce enough radiation to do that. Radon daughters, what that whole thing is, the radon washout and all that, what that actually is, is that it's a piece of the uranium decay chain. Uranium. The very end of that decay chain is this, before you hit lead. I basically put uranium decays and uh, decays by release of radiation, in this case usually alpha, to another element, which then decays to another element, another element, another element, and so on and so on and so on. And it does this until it becomes stable. Um, there is a point during this whole decay chain, and it's quite complicated and long convoluted. You can go to Wikipedia and look it up if you like. There's a point, though, where you hit, ra uh, where you hit radon 222. And then, boom, you take off like a roller coaster, and you shoot, shoot, shoot really fast through a bunch of different things. And uh, let me see if I have it brought up here somewhere. God, I hate reading stuff off the Internet. It's so tacky when you're trying to explain stuff to people. It's so, so ever-loving tacky. And yet, radon... It still needs to be done. So I apologize for the tackiness of what I'm doing right here. It's very, very, very inappropriate to be looking stuff up on the internet while you're talking. But from uranium-234, if you go to thorium-226, here, you hit radon-222, and it has a half-life of 3.8 days. 3.8 days later, you get a polonium-218 that has a half-life of 3.1 minutes. Then right after that, you shoot over here to lead-214, and it has a half-life of 26.8 minutes. These are very short half-lives. And that goes to bismuth with uh, 20 minutes, uh, polonium-214 with uh, 164 microseconds, and here's another one for one, uh, one minute, three seconds. Blah, blah, blah. So you shoot through all of these sorts of things, and at the very end, one of the last things you do is you hit polonium-210, and then you hit lead. Polonium-210 minus 4 is lead-206, right? Yes, lead-206. What I'm trying to say by this is that that's, the theory is that people detect large amounts of radiation suddenly from their rain, and it disappears rapidly. With hours and hours later, there's nothing left. The, the, the levels have dropped. Well, that is somewhat consistent with radon washout, but not really. Within several hours, a lot of it could be gone. But not more than maybe 50-60% of it at the most. If you wish, I can calculate the entirety of a model of it decaying. I can do that. It's complicated, but I can do that. Um, I could probably model it mathematically. I, I, I'm a computer scientist. I model, model things mathematically anyway, so I might actually just create a model for its decay product with a start amount and so on, if people actually want to see that. Um, but it's very unlikely you get is the, the rates people see. It has been documented before. Here I am on the internet again. It's totally terrible. Uh, there was a famous article put out here. It's a pretty good one. Uh, what... Uh, de deposition of uh, radon-222 progeny in northern Finland measured with an automatic precipitation gamma analyzer. Basically put these, these uh, uh, folks out here, and this is published, by the way, in the uh, Oxford Journal. So that's decently reputable. They took a scintillator and they captured rainwater and they detected 9 point something, what is it? 9.1 times 10 to the fifth uh, decay, I think it's decays per second. Measuring 9.1 times 10 to the fifth becquerels per liter is a hell of a lot of radiation. But that's a one of. I have not actually seen anything remotely close to this since, and nothing, nothing that didn't use a scintillator. Not only do scientists usually use scintillators, but Geiger counters are never going to capture rates that high. You just aren't going to find it. But the point is, if you find one, two, three hundred counts per minute with a large pancake Geiger Mueller tube, I can see that. I can understand that. With this little ditzy thing right here, I found uh, as much as two times my normal background. A useless piece of knowledge without knowing my actual background. My background is 14 counts per minute. 14, 14 is 28. The reality is I actually found up to 36 counts per minute. 
So uh, 36 minus 14 is 22, right? 24. So 24 counts per minute net is what I found before in this little guy. I posted that on a video. You actually, if you see, if you looked, you might have actually seen it. That video was not well put together because of the fact that I was in the middle of a rainstorm trying to shoot it. But I didn't think that people would be too willing to question 36 counts per minute. So I didn't worry about the fuss of setting everything up as I said I would. If I detected some unrealistic amount, then I would definitely test it. To give you another example of what I mean, let's open the polonium. This is a tenth of a microcarrier polonium-210. This is a tremendous amount of radiation. And yet, getting it pretty close, it's not touching, but it is nearly touching. What can I get? Six thousand seven hundred and fifty. Seven thousand. Eight thousand. All right. So it's really hard to get that close without touching it. I was able to pick up 8,000 counts per minute, okay? With my other Geiger counters, you've seen in other videos, I can pick up as much as 26,000 counts per minute from the same source. I require a tenth of a microcarry of polonium-210 directly exposed to my Geiger tube at about 5 millimeters distance in order to get anything over 10,000 counts per minute or even 20. That is a hell of a lot of radiation. A hell of a lot of radiation. And if I scraped this off, which I'd be really stupid to do because polonium is incredibly deadly, but if I scrape this off and fill up one liter of water with it, and then I, I, I rubbed a towel through it carefully and then put it on the ground and rubbed my Geiger counter over it, I'd probably pick up very little of anything. I want you just to think for a minute of just how much radiation would actually have to be in rainwater to pick up 10,000 plus counts per minute. Think about that. Think of how much would have to be in there. It's a tremendous dosage to pick up with a standard Geiger counter. If you were putting it in a, vi a little tiny vial and inserting it into a cavern scintillator tube, yeah, it's no big deal. Of course, you pick up all kinds of stuff. But to do it with a, with, with a pancake, Geiger and Mueller tube, This is the hottest thing I have. This polonium-210 is the hottest thing that I have. And I can't even come close to that. God, that's so hot, too. It's tremendously radioactive. Short size. Little nasty thing. And yet, even with as much radiation as this thing has in it, I can't come near that. So... If anybody posts a video like that, then they should also take their water and they should send it to a lab and have it tested. If the radiation is gone, the laboratory will be able to, de to detect uh, the, the, the uh, isotopes that are left over through either a, 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 gamma, a gamma spectrographic analysis or, because I can never say gamma spectrography correctly, I can never say that word for some reason, I'm not sure why, and I love complex words like electroencephalographic audiometry. But anyway, <clears throat> You either could have the, the, the sample tested to see what, it's, uh, uh, what, what kind of gamma energy comes from it, or you could put it through a mass spectrometer. Either one of these two would tell you, regardless of whether the radiation quickly dissipates and all this other stuff that people go on about, and it really honestly shouldn't if it's a uh, radon washout, which does exist, by the way, too, and can readily be detectable with a good enough Geiger counter. Additionally, if anybody comes to you and says they've detected levels this high, you should uh, you should really ask them why, have they contacted the, the Environmental Protection Agency? Are they going to contact the Environmental Protection Agency? Maybe you should do it for them. So if your neighbor's running around with a Geiger counter detecting 10,000 counts per minute in his rainwater, 
if he's not going to contact the EPA, why don't you contact the EPA? Because it's like watching somebody's house burning. Just because it's not your house doesn't mean it's not going to affect you. And realistically speaking, we need to determine if there really are uh, uh, radioactive rain showers falling upon us that are this high and things need to be done about it. And of course if they're not, then the people who are spreading this sort of stuff need to be you know, exposed. So one or the other. And by the way, I'm not saying that these things are true or not true. I'm saying that w whether they are true or aren't true, the reality is they need to be examined either way. If somebody shows a couple hundred counts per minute in the air, wouldn't worry about it. It's not good, mind you, but it's within the realm of possible. The other could be possible, the really high stuff, but only on extremely strange terms. So, I'll get nice and lots of nice uh, hate mail from this one, I'm sure, like I always do. This has been Tom from anti-proton.com, and, uh, Alrighty, let's erase what I was doing here beforehand, which was calculations for my Geiger counter. Let's see here, I have an alpha particle from Ray Don. Yeah, I just wrote the whole thing in caps. Ray Don, and let's see, Ray Don 222 has an alpha particle whose energy is equal to 5.590 million electron volts. Okay, let's figure this out. Uh, what we're going to be pretty much doing is we're going to be taking the CSDA range over... Um, see, CSDA range over um, uh, density of air... Pretty much, sort of, maybe, sort of, maybe, you get the point. Okay, that's going to be in centimeters per, no, it's centimeters per gram. That's going to be in grams per centimeters uh, squared, and that's going to be in grams per centimeters cubed. So now we can erase these figures, and we can write it up. I already looked this up, uh, because I don't want to sit here and do integration, because, well, integration takes forever. I actually used Wolfram Alpha because I was being lazy and lame. And I uh, wrote my figures down already, so I already know what I'm writing down. Uh, I determined that an alpha particle in regular air at 20 degrees uh, 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 centigrade in normal atmospheric conditions at sea level and standard humidity would have a density of, blah, let's see, 1.204 times 10 to the negative third grams per centimeters cube. This is after the video, so this is all informal at this point. Okay, and then I calculated the CSD, why can't I remember that acronym? The CSDA from Wolfram Alpha because I don't want to integrate because it takes forever. And that came up with 0.0051. You know, 0.0051. We could just write that in scientific notation and save ourselves some time. 5.18 uh, 10 negative third grams per cubic centimeter. And the resulting calculation is. Uh, boogity, boogity, uh, let's see, 4.3.302, boogity, that's official, 4.302 centimeters, so, go to wolframalpha.com, or learn integration. Or learn integration, your choice. This is hard. This is easy. Put that number in. The stopping power over air. The average, and by the way, the temperature changes very little. Temp cha change in this number with respect to change in, to change in air pressure, air temperature, None of those make very much difference. They do a little bit, but not much. 
and that's about, give or take, how far radon-222 alpha particles could possibly go, which means that if that's a speck of radon-222, it can go back that far. Creepy, huh? And that's how you do it.